Have you ever wondered what happens to the food you eat once you've chewed it and swallowed it? Well, we're about to find out. I'm at the Early Start Discovery space and we're about to walk through a replica of the human digestive system. Ew. Let's start from the beginning. Think about your most favourite food in the world. Picture it in your mind. Smell it, taste it, got it? I'm thinking about lemon gelato. Yum. My mouth is already watering. Is yours? Even before you eat, when you smell a tasty food, when you see it, when you think about it, digestion begins. Your mouth starts watering and saliva and spit form. When you do eat, the saliva, teeth and your tongue help to break down the chemicals in the food, which makes the food mushy and easy to swallow. Your teeth are chewing while your tongue is pushing around all the food. When you're ready to swallow, the food moves to the back part of your throat, the esophagus, the second part of the digestive tract. The muscles in the esophagus contract like a wave, pushing the food down slowly, which can take around two or three seconds. Your stomach is attached to the end of the esophagus and is a stretchy sac, kind of shaped like the letter J, and it has three important functions. To store the food we eat, to turn that food into a liquidy mixture with the help of gastric juices, and to empty its contents into the small intestine. The small intestine is a really long tube packed right in beneath the stomach. If you stretched it out, an adult small intestine could be 6.5 metres long. The small intestine helps to extract proteins and fats with a little help from three friends, the pancreas, the liver and the gallbladder. Your food may spend up to four hours in the small intestine where it becomes a really thin liquidy mixture that the nutrients are able to better get into the blood. From there, the nutrients go to the liver and all those waste products. The stuff that the body doesn't need moves on to the large intestine. The large intestine is fatter than the small intestine and is the last stop on our digestive tract. After the nutrients are removed from the food mixture, there's waste left over, things our body just can't use, and that stuff needs to be removed. Before it goes, it passes through the part of the large intestine called the colon, which is where the body gets to absorb any water or minerals left over. As the water is absorbed, it becomes harder and harder, and this waste product then turns into a solid. Yep. It's poop. So here we are at the end of our story, the rear end or the rectum. This is the last stop on the digestive tract. Solid waste stays here until you're ready to go to the bathroom. And when you go to the bathroom, you'll be getting rid of the waste by pushing it through. It's been a long, interesting journey, but now it's time to leave the digestive tract as poop. Yep, if this was a real human body, I would be the waste product. I would be poo. Thanks a lot, guys. Oh. Welcome. I'm reporting from the Golden Throne because today on Get Clever, we're talking about that very unpopular bodily function, brown and smelly poo. Oh. Oh. Poo smells gross. <laughs> you might call it poop, doo doo, dung, excrement, scat, feces, number twos, the poop thesaurus goes on and on. But it's kind of smelly in here, and I think it might be time to get out and give these other people some privacy. waste left behind after we've finished digesting our food and it's all that material that our bodies can't absorb. So uh, next time we drop the kids off at the pool, have a good little inspection and see what's been left behind.
I'm at the Australian Museum to look at the many different types of animal poo. Let's talk about animal poo, because as we know, there are no toilets in the wild, which means that animals can go to the toilet anywhere that they want. And that really helps us to find out all about the animals by studying their poo. First, the shape of poos. Now, wombats famously leave square poos behind, while kangaroos leave round nuggets. What about poo colour? Well, possums aren't very picky eaters, so they poo out a rainbow. Anything from red all the way through to black. Breaking open a poo, which I recommend you leave to the experts, can tell you even more about the thing that left it behind. In a vegetarian animal's poo, you'll find the remains of all the grass and leaves that they've been eating. And in a meat-eater's poo, you'll find fur and bones from all the animals that they've been chomping on. Scientists use poo to see what animals are eating, what nasty bugs might be growing in their bodies, and they can study the whole population without having to see the animal. For some animals, their poo can be more visible or sniffable than the animal themselves. For example, rare or nocturnal animals. Did you know there's actually a word for eating your own poo? And it's not disgusting, it's coprophagy. And rabbits actually eat their own poo because it's part of their diet. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> It's like taking a vitamin tablet for them. So remember, the next time you're overcome by the smell or the look of a poo, it's actually really helpful. I'm here at Sydney Water, and I can confirm it's not a chocolate factory like I was told. I'm here to see how water is recycled. So the dirty water from your home, like when you flush the toilet, or let the dirty water out of your sink. The first step in recycling water, or the primary treatment, is to separate all the solid material from the wastewater. And this is done in a giant tank where all the solids sink to the bottom and they're scraped out. Looks pretty gross. So my name is Tom, Tom Barodi. I'm a gastroenterologist and some call me a poo doctor. So I work with the gut and its illnesses. And the gut is a long tube that we all have and it starts with the mouth and finishes with the bottom. And it is said that there are nearly 100 trillion bacterial cells that live in this long tube, our gut. And when you compare it with the number of cells that we have in our body, there's only about 10 trillion in our body. So in a way, we are 10%, one tenth human and 90% poo cells. And so this poo can easily become infected if you eat infected food because it goes straight into the gut. <coughs> and when things go wrong, oh, they can go wrong for the rest of one's life. And that's when we come in treating and trying to fix up and repair a broken poo. This is where we carry out all the endoscopic procedures, looking in people's tummies and their, and their bellies by using little instruments like this. And as you can see, we can look inside or go all the way down into the stomach to see if there's any problems there. We then diagnose the condition and treat as we have to for that particular illness. So if a person acquires a chronic infection oh. and if antibiotics fail, we use treatment using fecal transplantation by administering it as an enema. A poo transplant 
is a treatment process where we obtain a healthy poo from a donor who's healthy, who doesn't have any infections, and they deliver it in a container that is oxygen free, so the bacteria are alive. We then process it in the laboratory where we put it into a special blender and we do this very quickly. And then we put this into an enema bag, filtered so it can go through the tubing and into someone's bottom. And we run this in, massage their tummy, and then it stays inside that person to do its job on the unhealthy poo that might still be remaining after they've been washed out. So the transplantation is inserting healthy into the sick person. Poo transplantation should be done in a clinic or in a hospital, and it should never be ever tried at home by yourself. Back in the early days, in the 80s, it was thought to be weird, crazy. And that's fine because it's so unacceptable initially to put poo into someone's bottom. But as time passed, when these very ill people became well, it became completely accepted that that is another therapeutic or therapeutic way to go and fix a sick poo, just like we transplant hearts or kidneys or livers. We also transplant poo, although it doesn't look like an organ. And so we do look for people to become poo donors. And of course, we're always on the lookout for a perfect poo. And it could be you. So generally speaking, we have good bacteria and we acquire bad bacteria. They are killed off by the good ones and we stay well. So these bad bugs are traveling into our bodies on food. You can also catch it by shaking hands with someone who didn't wash their hands after leaving a toilet. And that's why it's so important to wash your hands after having gone to the toilet. Keep your hands out of your mouth, wash your hands before you're going to eat or drink because it can be transmitted into the gut flora and in some people it'll stay there for good. What we do here at the clinic is we keep trying, trialing various new therapies simply because there's a problem that needs to be solved. So in the future, when you do medicine, guys, girls, don't walk in other people's footsteps, try new things. And so one would ask how many times per day should be going? And probably the best answer is one soft sausage per day. So soft poo is the nice poo. So if there were important messages to take away, I feel that the most important one is try and maintain an intake of fiber enough, fruits, vegetables, to grow those bacteria inside you that keep you healthy. When one sees patients being given a poo enema, the strength, the power of that poo is absolutely amazing. It can cure overnight from 20 diarrheal stools per day to normal stool or virtually constipation. It's just overnight cure. So in fact, the power of poo is absolutely amazing. I'm here learning about recycling water. In the primary stage, the solids are separated from the water. In the secondary stage, the nutrients that aren't needed are separated using physical, biological and chemical processes. Wow, I'm starting to think this place is kind of grossly cool. Come here, my pretties. Worms, they're unsung heroes. We don't give them enough credit for what they do. They wriggle around in dark, dirty, damp dirt all day, every day, without a single complaint. They eat our garbage and poo out perfection. So let's celebrate them and give them a new worm farm kingdom. And here it is. They're gonna love it here. Just kidding. Worms are much better suited to something like this, a worm farm. And unlike us, worms love a dark, damp home. Worm farms 
worms are basically a compost bin that use worms to break down our food scraps much faster than if we left them to crumble to nothing. But the most obvious difference between compost and worm farms is the smell. You can't smell anything, can you? Well, that's because it doesn't smell. Let's make one. It only takes a couple of minutes once you've got all your gear and your garden flowers are going to love you for it. So you just need some gardening gloves, two polystyrene boxes, a mask because we're using potting mix, so that can be a bit toxic, a watering can full of water, some torn up newspapers, worms and some food scraps. And if your box doesn't have a lid, a piece of hessian on top will do. Now in one of my foam boxes, I've punctured 14 evenly spaced holes. Now you can do that with your screwdriver or a pen at home. And you want to make sure that that box is placed on top. Then place a newspaper in the box. Along with your garden soil, but don't forget to put your mask on. Give it a mix with your hands and your box should be around three quarters full. Lightly water the surface with your watering can until it's all damp. And then toss it all together like a salad. Now it's time to unleash your worms. Spread them out along the surface, but be gentle. Oh, there's so many. It's amazing, as soon as I put them in, they dug right back down onto the soil. Now time to add our food scraps. It'll take a little while for our worms to get to that part of the menu because they'll feed on the newspaper for about a week. So I'm just adding some coffee grounds right now. And then I love adding lots of veggies. They love eating that. So I've got some offcuts from the kitchen, got some spinach, tomato, apple cores. And they love tea bags as well, but make sure you take the string off. Now, if your box doesn't come with a lid, that's what your hessian's for. Just place that on top. Go to sleep, little wormies. In about 10 days' time, lift off your top box. Oh, it's heavy. And you'll see a gold-coloured liquid in the bottom, like tea. That's actually the worm poo, and it's a great natural fertiliser for your garden. Your flowers will love eating it. Yeah. Dilute the worm juice with water until it's the colour of wheat tea and then spray it all over your garden. To care for your new worm farm, only feed them veggies and avoid giving them too many citrus fruits as it can be too acidic. Don't throw in any meat scraps or bones as you'll find this will just attract flies and even rats. Completely avoid ever putting plastic and non-organic garbage into the farm. And coffee grinds and tea bags without the string and tag help the worms' digestion. Now just sit back and watch your worms eat their way through life. Hmm, that sounds like me. I'm here at Sydney Water, and what a beautiful place this is. Pools for swimming, out here in the sunshine, it's almost like a resort. Oh, then they're not for swimming? It's still part of the water treatment process? OK, great. This is a tertiary stage of water recycling, where they add chemicals in the water to help remove the solid particles that are still there and to disinfect the water as well. After this, they can be used to do things like water your garden.